this is part four of a seminar John gave at Cabela's in Tulalip, Washington. In this seminar, John talks about getting your big game harvest from the field to the freezer. In this last segment, John talks about processing and sanitation. You need a sharpening steel, uh, some form of sharpening steel to utilize. They carry chef choice diamond ones here. Um, I use a Forstner, which is also a Victoria Knox uh, sharpening steel. I'll show you guys here. Mine is two sided. So you can see I have a smooth side here and then I have a coarse side here. You see a lot of them that come with your knife kits in your kitchen. They're really coarse. And a sharpening steel is to put your edge back on your knife not to sharpen your knife. That's what a sharpening stone's for. So if you were to envision your knife edge looks like this. When it gets dull, what has happened is an edge has rolled over. So this will let me put the edge back on my knife and get both equal so it comes to a straight point. If you were to look at the blade edge of a knife under the light, any shininess right down the, the blade edge, you've rolled your edge there. And a, just a gentle swipe on the steel will work. Now you say, well, you know, I don't want to make the investment for this. A screwdriver, a long Phillips screwdriver with the smooth works just fine. You know, so again, I don't like the coarse ones. I think they grab too much on the knife and don't do it service. service. Um, go with the finer or two-sided. They do make a, this is a pretty smooth diamond one that's pretty nice. Uh, that Cabela's carries here. So um, a couple things to think about there. Cut safe glove. We have that in our fanny pack. I've talked to you about that. Plastic bags, Ziploc bags, and freezer bags. When it comes to processing it at your own house, you can make the determination of, of what you want to use. If you have a little Cabela's grinder like this grinder here, when it comes to your ground meat, you can grind them right into these plastic bags and it holds really nice. Um, there's an attachment. I don't know where it went. Um, on the end of the grinder that you can go right in there or you can use a sausage stuffer for that application. Myself, personally, I use a freezer wrap and this is available here. And one thing important about the freezer wrap, see how it's got a wax side to it? You can save some money. These run about, uh, I think they're 69 bucks here. Uh, for a roll of this, that'll last you a super long time. Um, but anyway, the reason why you want a wax side, it's going to help protect the meat a lot better. You can go right in there. I usually buy some little plastic bags, throw the meat in the plastic bags, then do one wrap. If you're not going to use plastic bags, I would double up this, and then you simply use freezer tape, um, which is right here, a nice little dispenser also available here at Cabela's where I tape my packages up and I'll do that when I process the goat in there for you. And then for those of you that like vacuum packers, um, they're certainly available to use and good. Here's one thing that I've found um, with wild game, especially in using a vacuum packer, is you almost need to chill or freeze the meat to get a good seal on it. And I know the first time I got my food saver, and my son and I, we both harvested a deer, and I'm gonna try vacuum packing and seeing how it did. And I put it in there, and my seal wasn't nice and tight like this. And so I called the guy, and I says, at Food Saver, and I says, hey, I don't like my seal that I see. And uh, basically, in a nutshell, if your meat's soft, it's not gonna get as good a seal, and, and you want as least amount of moisture as possible in there. So if you throw it in the freezer for a little bit and get a crust on it, then go to that food saver, you're gonna get a much better seal on it. And then last but not least is a grinder, whether it's a handheld, a little Cabela's one, a commercial one, KitchenAid, something to grind up your trim. Uh, quickly, I'm gonna talk about sanitation. You know, we've talked about temperature control and getting our meat down to the proper temperature as soon as possible and getting it cool. Contact surfaces is something a lot of us don't think about when we start cutting our animal in our own home. And 
Dirty food contact surfaces is one of the biggest contributors to foodborne illness. I work in a retail industry, um, oversee 315 stores from Alaska all the way down through Montana and Oregon, and the amount of time, effort, and uh, you know, controls that we put in place, our HACCP plan for having clean food contact surfaces for the public is just um, mind boggling. So be very attentive to that. If you're processing an animal, you're gonna wanna wipe down your food contact surfaces like your table um, between pieces to ensure it stays clean. You're gonna wanna use a bleach solution um, to reduce that chance of uh, contamination. Make sure you wash your hands often. So you go out in the garage and you grab a hind quarter that, you know, potentially, hopefully we did our job of cleaning it when we got home, but you grab that hind quarter and maybe it had a little bit of stomach matter on it because we punctured the gut. Well now, it's on my hands. Now everything I touch along the way is gonna be contaminated with that and that bacteria and everything's there. So be, be cautious, just wash your hands. Um, on the bleach solution, you want a bleach solution for food contact surfaces that's 100 parts per million. And you're saying, okay, well, how do I do the math of that? Well, I, I simplified it a little bit. Um, keep in mind your, your knife is a food contact surface. So if I'm out here and I'm processing and creaming off some product that's not so good, this is contaminated. I've just transported it right along. I might as well leave that stuff on and eat it all, right? So be aware that your knife is a food contact surface and that's why you want to use gloves and some different things. So um, on, on that, yes, sir. Would your hand cleaner, that, that uh, alcoholic hand cleaner or like a vinegar? Sanitizer, hand, hand sanit sanitizer or a vinegar uh, water mix? <laughs> Uh, the, the acid in a vinegar mix, we would use it, I would just say, in a commercial um, environment. We don't use something like that. We, we go with a quattro ammonium or a chlorine sanitizer to kill black bacteria. Hand sanitizer is fine, but don't use it as a contact, food contact surface cleaner. That would be for washing your hands. But I will say this as well. Hand sanitizer does not replace washing your hands. Washing your hands in hot and soapy water for 20 seconds is better than hand sanitizer. So the hand sanitizer is more of a in-between if you don't have the opportunity to do that fully. But the bleach solution is really simple. Um, here's what I would say though, guys, when you go up, and I know we don't get into the laundry room very often, don't get linen scent bleach to use for it. You don't want scented product, okay? Um, but one and a half ounces of bleach to three gallons of 75 degree water. You want room temperature water and that will be the most effective uh, food contact sanitizer that you can have. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about processing before I do the demonstration. Um, I threw a, a cow up here to show you the different cuts of meat because there's a lot of people out there that say, well, where does it come from? And what's the proper cooking method that I can use it for? So the chuck shoulder, you're gonna get your roast, your stew meat, and your ground meat out of it, and that's the chuck area or the front end of the animal. The rib, the short loin, and the tenderloin are your best steaks. Anybody guess why they're the best steaks? Pardon me? Exactly. Your front shoulder and your hind legs are used for motion, okay? And those muscles are being worked. The rib and the short loin aren't, it's their back, and they're not used, so they're more tender, they're more relaxed. The tenderloin, which sits on the inside, is the most tender because that muscle's just kind of hanging out. It's not getting a lot of use um, whatsoever. But the round on the back, which is best for roast stew, jerky, and ground meats, that muscle's working. And that's what makes it tougher. And then the remaining cuts are for ground beef. Same thing applies when you're looking at a deer for example, and we'll go around the clock starting at 12 o'clock. You got your back straps with your steaks and roasts. You got your rumps, you'll get some roast steaks and kebabs out of there. On down to the round, you can see what you'll yield out of that. You have your shank where you're gonna get burger and sausage. 
in through here on the rib cage on an elk you might get a little bit that's good enough for jerky um, but on a deer there's really not enough to salvage in there um, i see a lot of people especially if you've punctured the gut i steer pretty clear away of the internal rib meat i don't want that in there and then your front shoulder if you shoot your animal in your shoulder oftentimes you're going to lose the opportunity of getting a roast out of it it's going to be more hamburger or used for sausage and then your neck meat you can bone out as well as your shank you, your bone structure here comes here goes here and then you have your blade bone there so if you could tuck that bullet right in that pocket and miss that front shoulder altogether that's great but you know not often does a deer or elk stand with both legs the same way usually it's one legs in front of the other so if i miss coming in i'm going to hit it on the exit on the way out but that's that's the nature of the beast so uh, some processing tips if for steaks first and foremost you want to use a sharp knife okay if you're going to be boning an animal out the sharper you can get your knife the better i could do a whole seminar on sharpening um, and maybe at one point in time i will do that um, but definitely have a sharp knife. You're going to want to cream off the, ex the exterior layer of the meat. So as that animal ages, it gets kind of hard and you see the sinew and the gristle. If you've ever had the opportunity to harvest a deer or an elk, you want to cut that off where that membrane has been removed off of this loin and it's just solid meat. A couple reasons why is that exterior contact, that exterior surface is going to have the most bacteria. So if it was dirty or you got anything on it, removing it uh, is definitely the best thing. You want to remove your gristle and then you want to cut across the grain of the meat. So the grain of this runs this direction and you want to cut across the grain at a 90 degree angle on the grain of the meat to make it as tender as you possibly can. Don't cut with the grain. You won't have a great eating experience. A piece of meat will get bigger and bigger as you chew it. So across the grain uh, will give you the best, the best shot there. So for roasts, you want to use a sharp knife. You know, when we talk about contact surfaces, you could see a fat layer there. If that was me and that was exposed. I'm going to trim that off and make that all nice, clean piece of meat. Some people say, well, I want the game fat on there. That's fine. I don't. If I want a little bit of fat, I'll put some bacon around it and give it some additional flavor. But I'm not, I don't care for uh, game fat myself. So we creamed off a layer. Um, we removed the exterior gristle to aid in tenderness and that's roast. And that's, that's a bottom round here off of the hind leg. That's a sirloin tip and that's the top round. It's uh, some of the, the muscles that go around that femur bone. So grinding sausage. Here's this, the reason why I grabbed this picture off the internet is this is an atypical home butcher. Okay, so think of the things I talked about today with temperature control, food safety. What do you identify that's wrong with this picture? It's in the sink. A, it's in the sink. He's got it laying on a dirty rag. It's got it laying on a dirty rag. What else? There's something glaring there. Yeah, there is a pot in the sink. Here's, here's what I see that just sends me crazy see that you still have hide and skin on it and its feet you want to talk about contamination and dirty contact surfaces that animal is living in the wild it doesn't have the opportunity to hop in the shower and take a bath right this is going to get transported to this towel and god forbid if that's his wiping towel for food contact surface i'm getting hair into the house i'm getting hair into my work surface and then you also have the blood shot there that can be removed before you bring it into the final stage. But this is, I remember growing up and watching my grandpa harvested, you know, process the deer in the kitchen and it was an all day process and it was no different than that. And so I thought, you know, what a great opportunity to show this. So ground meat and sausage, it's the most dangerous type of meat that you're gonna handle. And the reason why is there's more food contact surfaces because it's not whole muscles, it's little bits and pieces throughout the animal that, that aren't as good that you're gonna throw 
into that area. Also, what ends up happening is you process it, you throw it in a little lugger off to the side, and once you've done with everything, then usually you deal with your ground meat. And then the next thing is when you run it through the head of the grinder, right here, it's heating it up. Okay, these grinder plates and knives, it's, the meat's gonna get chopped up by this knife and it's gonna get ran through this plate. I'm increasing the temperature so the bacteria activity with the oxygen that gets to it and going through the heat, the bacteria will multiply. That's why most people, if they get sick, it's off of hamburger. That's why they say the cooking temperature on hamburger should be 165 degrees versus you can eat rare beef at 130. And it's because the 165 degrees will kill all that bacteria in the hamburger. All right, guys, if you missed any part of this seminar, go back and watch those segments so you get all of the information necessary to be successful getting your harvest from the field to the freezer. Folks, if you did not attend this seminar, you missed some great additional information. At the end of this seminar, John processes a goat showing you all the steps he talked about in the presentation. Unfortunately, we just don't have enough time to show you all of that great information. If you'd like to stay up to date on John's upcoming seminars or for more information about John's services, visit his website at johnsnorthwestoutdoors.com. Thanks for watching.